uh, and perhaps maybe there could be a function for uh, diplomacy or, or just an, uh, for people to express ideas uh, in, in that function, whether it would be a one-way dictation or even potentially uh, some, some per way of having a, a two-way conversation. Well, I think the Internet is becoming our global uh, nervous system and communication backbone. Uh, it, does, it does allow virtual worlds. You already have things like Second Life and so on where you can enter a virtual reality world with other people. And you might say, well, the Second Life isn't as realistic as real reality. That's true today. But, I mean, look at how video games went from, you know, Pong, which was a you know, very unrealistic representation of ping pong or tennis, uh, to the very highly realistic, you know, animations and, and, and virtual reality you have now in games, and that will take the leap to full immersion three-dimensional virtual reality. So these virtual reality environments that exist uh, on our computers, empowered by the Internet where we can communicate with anyone, is ultimately going to become full immersion vir virtual reality. We don't actually have to go inside the nervous system to do that. We can have images written directly to our retina from our eyeglasses, the systems will detect our head motion and will actually put us into a full immersion virtual reality environment. This technology already exists. It's expensive today, but it will be ubiquitous and inexpensive in the future. And so then, even if you and I, being hundreds of miles apart, we could enter a virtual reality environment and it would seem just like we're there. We can look around each other, at least visually and auditorily, which is how most of our meetings are conducted. We can be in a virtual reality environment. If so if you want to have a diplomatic uh, conversation, we could create a virtual hall of Versailles and, uh, and have a meeting just like we're together. Uh, and of course, we use the current state of the technology to create virtual communication all the time. This will be very realistic. We've got 10 years. This is you know, how most meetings will take place. You know, the whole technology of buildings, classrooms, lecture halls, cities is really for aggregating people so we can get together and communicate. We're going to be increasingly doing that in virtual environments as these virtual environments get more and more realistic to the point where they're indistinguishable from real reality. And when we can go inside the nervous system and do that from inside the nervous system, it will in also include the tactile and other senses and it will really be just like being together. We have one more hour with our guest, Ray Kurzweil. As we go to break, we're going to look at uh, one of the machines that he has developed, especially one that helps him or helps blind people uh, help them to read. We'll see that and then we'll come right back. So this is actually the original Kurzweil reading machine. Uh, <coughs> and it was actually the first CCD flatbed scanner. The uh, imaging device can only see about an inch. So it actually scans each line individually. But this was the first scanner, flathead scanner, which is now ubiquitous. And I developed the first Omnify character recognition, the first character recognition that could recognize any type style. And that was sort of a solution in search of a problem. And I happened to sit next to a blind guy on a plane who said, gee, he can do anything, he's quite independent, but he can't read ordinary printed material. So that really, from that point on, I devoted the character recognition software to the blind reading problem. And we developed the scanner. We actually developed the first full print, uh, text to speech synthesis. So those are the three distinct technologies. And we put them together in the first print to speech reading machine. And this, this is from the 70s. It came out in, the in 1976. But you can see it's the size of a dishwasher. And it's looking for the first page of print. Four and seven years ago, our father brought thought upon this continent a new nation, conceived in liberty, and dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal. Now, we are engaged in a great civil war, testing whether that nation, or any nation so conceived and so dedicated, can long endure. When this came out, ca character recognition at that time could only deal in a single type style. It had to be unit spaced, letters could not touch one another. They couldn't deal with any kind of printing errors. The people actually retype documents using a special type ball with the selected typewriter before they would scan them in using character recognition. So this was the first really intelligent character recognition. And a version of this was actually used to create the, these big databases in the 1970s and early 80s, like Lexis and Nexus, 
so that was a commercial application. Uh, but this was the first printed speech reading machine for the blind. And since it was expensive and large, it was used in institutions like libraries and schools. And, uh, and over the years, it's come down in size. Uh, up until recently, the Kurzweil 1000 was a small desk-based system, a little scanner with, a, with your personal computer. But it was still a, a desk-based system. You had to bring material back to your desk. And there's a lot of material you can't bring back to your desk, like sign on the wall or a bank ATM display. You could bring a menu back to your desk, but you'd rather read it in the restaurant. Labels in your clothing, remainders at a book sale, handouts at a meeting. So the, the holy grail has always been a device that a blind person can take in their pocket and just take out and read material as they go through the day. So it took 30 years, because this was 1976, and actually this year, 2006, 30 years later, we, we introduced the first pocket-sized machine. So this is the Kurzweil National Federation of the Blind Reader. We developed it with the National Federation of the Blind. I actually worked with them on the first reading machine in 1976. Uh, this is a thousand times smaller than that first reading machine, a thousand times lighter. And the computer is actually a thousand times as powerful. So it gives you some idea. That's a million to one ratio in terms of the power of computation. A blind person could just hold it up to a wall, and it'll tell them where the print is, if it's cutting off the right or left edges. Feel the theater board. Right bottom and left edges are visible. Forty-four percent filled. Okay, so it sees most of the edges. Let's we'll take, take a picture. picture. And it's going to give us progress reports. This page could be t rotated any amount. In fact, it degrees. It deals with picture. three different degrees of freedom of tilt and rotation. And so you can really hold the camera any which way, and it'll actually correct the image camera inside its memory. Camera is zero degrees clockwise relative to the page. So it said I got it right on, but I could have rotated way. it. Page one, Geonology 189. The AI winter is long since over. We are well into the spring of narrow AI. Most of the examples above were research projects just 10 to 15 years ago. If all the AI systems in the world suddenly stopped functioning, our economic infrastructure would grind to a halt. Uh, pages can be curved in a book, and the software in here actually straightens out the image, cleans it up, and enhances it, and then does the recognition of the letters, and then figures out the pronunciation. And so all of that's being done in the computer inside this device. It's actually a good example of my models of predicting technology trends. Because in, in 2002, four years ago, I had a conversation with the National Federation of the Blind. They said, well, when do you think these portable reading machines will be feasible? And I said, according to our models, the requisite digital camera and per pocket computer technology will be feasible in four years, by 2006. And that actually turned out to be exactly correct. And I also felt it would take four years to develop the software. So we started 2002. And the software got done, the hardware became available right on schedule, and we introduced this in 2006. Other people are now waking up to the fact, oh, you, the cameras and pocket computers are powerful enough to do this, and they're starting the research now. It's going to take them a few years to develop the software. So we have a jump on the market because of our ability to predict where technology will be in the future. And this is something I've been doing for 30 years, and my books are based on the same technology models. Uh, so we can forecast where technology will be in four years, or 10 years, or 20 years. Here are the 10 best-selling hardcover nonfiction books from the New York Times for the week ending October 21st. For the second week in a row, The Innocent Man tops the list, John Grisham chronicles a convicted man's near execution for murder and his subsequent exoneration. Senator Barack Obama premieres on the list at number two. His book is The Audacity of Hope. At number three is Washington Post reporter Bob Woodward's third book about the Bush administration, State of Denial. Next is Culture Warrior. Bill O'Reilly describes an American culture war defined by religion, race, and other issues. Fifth is a collection of essays on aging by screenwriter Nora Ephron. I feel bad about my neck. In his memoir, The Life and Times of the Thunderbolt Kid, Bill Bryson describes growing up in Des Moines in the 1950s. It premieres on the list this week at number six. Seventh is John Grogan's tribute to his Labrador retriever, Marley and Me. 
That's followed by the God delusion. Evolutionary biologist Richard Dawkins argues against the existence of God. Fox News anchor Steve Ducey presents observations on marriage and family life and number nine, the Mr. and Mrs. Happy Handbook. And rounding out the top ten is I Like You, Amy Sedaris's humorous guide to throwing parties. For more information, visit the New York Times website at nytimes.com. All right, we are back with our guest, Ray Kurzweil, who has written amongst many books, The Singularity is Near When Humans Transcend Biology. He has also written The Age of Spiritual Machines. And could you tell us a little about how you write books, what goes into how you do it? Uh, well, I actually start by writing an essay, what I want to accomplish in the book. Uh, and it'll be maybe a chapter-length essay. And then I expand that. Rather than just writing the book from start to finish, I'll expand the essay, make, you know, developing this part and that part, and, and develop it into a book. I get feedback from my research group and advisors as to ideas about you know, what should be expanded and questions that should be addressed. I have a research team that gathers data for me, so if I want to cover a certain area, they'll send me books and articles. Uh, and on our website, for example, on singularity.com, uh, we have all the a list of actually all the books and articles I read to write the book. And then as I write the material, I actually write the citations with it. Uh, there's about 2,000 scientific citations in Singularities Near and also Fantastic Voyage that I co-authored with Terry Grossman because uh, I'm making claims that uh, run counter to some conventional wisdom and so they, they need to be backed up by uh, strong evidence. And then I go through a rewriting process like any other author, getting feedback from my editor at, at the publisher and, and other people. Uh, I list all the people that gave me advice, uh, good or bad. I actually like criticism because that's the way to improve something. Uh, and finally, when I feel I can't improve it anymore, uh, I ship it out the door. But actually, I never get to that point. At some point, you have to declare it a moment in time, and this is the best I can do for the moment until the next book. Now, because you have technology that distinguishes human voice, do you dictate books, or do you type well, manually? Well, actually, I dictated most of the Age of Spiritual Machines, uh, really as an exercise to show use of that technology. Uh, I can dictate at 50 or 60 words a minute. That, that is actually what you can do with speech recognition. I happened to take typing in high school. That was one useful course I took. So I have very good typing skills. I can type 90 or 100 words a minute. So speech recognition actually slows me down. But most people type 15 or 20 words a minute. So speech recognition actually would speed up uh, most people, but uh, actually type pretty fast. In the age of spiritual machines and your acknowledgments, you amongst many list a gentleman named David High for actually devising a spiritual machine for the cover. What did you mean by that? Oh, well. It's kind of a holographic image there. Uh, and so we were trying to figure out you know, what would be a symbol for something so abstract as to be a spiritual machine. We don't want to just put a picture of a machine or some conventional high-tech image. So he created this just silver but holographic image that reflects the light in different ways depending on what uh, visual con condition you're in. Uh, so I thought it was kind of a cool way to symbolize a very abstract notion. How long does it take you to write a book, typically? Well, Singularity is Near and Fantastic Voyage I really wrote at the same time. Uh, the latter co-authored with Terry Grossman, although that didn't save time because we both really poured over every sentence. And we both feel passionately about every idea in there. And if we weren't already 99% on the same page, it would have been impossible. Because it wasn't like, okay, you do this and I'll do that, and we don't really care about the other sections. We really cared about every sentence. We would have 50 emails about one of the citations back and forth. But it came out a much better book because we really, if we had it, uh, came out initially with a different perspective on an issue, we would run it down and look at all the research until we really had enough in-depth knowledge to come to a better position uh, that we both felt comfortable with. So it's a much better book for that process. Uh, but it, it definitely took as long as either one of writing it ourselves. Uh, but I wrote both of these books uh, over a two-year period. Um, 
Uh, tell us about your family. 